As you breathe in and out, feel yourself sitting even taller. Feel that the eyes are closed, but not forcefully. And feel that the breath is flowing easefully. Feel that the light within is shining endlessly. And draw the hands together in front of the heart. And we'll lift our voices in one ohm, taking a breath in. Oh. So some of you are here with the retreat this weekend, and others of you are here for the day. This weekend has been the Kirtan Immersion Weekend, and that has been um, definitely a, a deep exploration of the inner light. And the ability that we inherently have as human beings to awaken within ourselves awareness of that inner light, and to be guided by it, and in fact to surrender to it to allow ourselves and our life to be the essence of that light. What is that light? What does it entail? Are you sure? Yeah, yeah. Okay. What does it entail? How do we understand it? How do we come to know it? And so today, we're going to talk about the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 10. In this chapter, Krishna explains to Arjuna uh, continuing from chapter 9, the essence of his own self, what Krishna is, who Krishna is, what that divinity is. And he gives him many examples. And I put our Kirtan Immersion faculty on the spot, ask them to come up here unexpectedly um, to join me so that they can also offer their profound insights into chapter 10. So the plan is, I'm going to be reading to you sections from this beautiful chapter, which is very short. It's only 42 verses. But in those 42 verses, there is such beautiful wisdom. And there's also an offering. It's the offering of a way to live life. It's an offering of a way to understand your humanness, your dharma, your path, your suffering, your sorrow, and your healing. And so we'll dive into that a bit today. I'll be reading from the Bhagavad Gita translation by Eknath Eshwaram. Um, and so I'll just dive right in. Krishna starts by saying to Arjuna, listen further. To my supreme teaching, which gives you such joy, desiring your welfare, O strong-armed warrior, I will tell you more. Neither gods nor sages know of my origin, for I am the source from which the gods and the sages come. Whoever knows me as the Lord of all creation, without birth or beginning, knows the truth and frees himself from all evil and suffering. Discrimination, wisdom, understanding, forgiveness, truth, self-control, peace of mind, pleasure and pain, birth and death, fear and courage, honor and dishonor, nonviolence, charity, equanimity, contentment, perseverance in spiritual different disciplines, all the different qualities found in living creatures have their source in me. The seven great sages and the four ancient ancestors were born from my mind and received my power. From them came all creatures of this world. Whoever understands my power and the mystery of my manifestations comes without doubt to be united with me. I am the source from which all creatures evolve. The wise remember this and worship me with loving devotion. Their thoughts are all absorbed in me and all their vitality flows to me, teaching one another, talking about me always, they are happy and fulfilled. 
To those steadfast in love and devotion, I give spiritual wisdom so that they may come to me. Out of compassion, I destroy the darkness of their ignorance. From within them, I light the lamp of wisdom and dispel all darkness from their lives. What a beautiful beginning to chapter 10, full of so much. And so I would love to hear, we'll start with Ma, Jyoti Ma, um, what those words hold for you, particularly keeping Krishna or divinity in mind always. I'm going to take my shirt back since I have to take it. I don't want to take away from someone else coming in. Axel. That's Jeremy. It's really beautiful because he starts off talking about joy and how do you seek joy. And, um, and then he reveals that all source of everything, you know, that we associate with life comes from him. And for those that want to have this love and devotion, right, we can seek that in him and he's going to dispel the darkness for them. And I just find this to be such a huge foundation because immediately he points to that everything in the world that we look at is, is that, is him. And that a lot of times when we think of the divine, it's always somewhere out there. And it has no context. Sometimes we associate it with a visual, like we might look at Krishna or the Divine Mother and have a picture in our head, but it seems so far away and distant from us, almost unattainable. And we don't necessarily walk through the world seeing Krishna or the Mother in each other. We don't walk through the gardens and see that in the trees. And the little critters, spiders, we're so disjointed from really what that is. Mm -hmm. And so he it has this introduction that every single thing that you encounter, the elements, the air, the rain, the trees, the squirrels, the spiders, the mosquitoes, the lanternflies, <laughs> are all Krishna. And that if you want to have this, this devotion, this love that individually as all humans, we all long for to feel like we belong and that we're loved, that's all there and available just by devoting yourself to, to that. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Thank you, Jyoti. Shambhu, how about you? What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> the question was, what does it mean to you when Krishna is explaining to Arjuna what it is to be devoted and the place of love in that devotion? So I, I put it into context, and this is a conversation between Krishna and me. I have to personalize it because that's, that's the audience in the Gita. So Krishna is not talking to some uh, general, Arjuna, some master of archery getting ready to set out upon this horrific task. And Arjuna is rightly given pause, and that's why this conversation comes up. Uh, Krishna, the dispeller of darkness. And I go, oh, well, okay. He's come to dispel darkness in me. What's that look like? Um, that looks like logic against bhakti, or devotion, or love. What you might not know is that the conversations I have with Swaminiji while you're present are the same conversations that Swaminiji and I have when it's just her and I. There's no uh, behind the curtain. So we were having a conversation before I went to India. And I said, you know, that first Saturday, I'll have gotten off a plane 12 hours before. and. Indian jet lag is pretty hellacious. Are you sure you want me to lead first Saturday? Jyoti's not going to be there. I can't, I can't rely <clears throat> on Jyoti. Are you sure? And she said, yes. And I asked again, are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> and she said, yes. And all morning and all afternoon and all evening, people were saying, why are you here? Why aren't you asleep? 
why are you teaching? They didn't say, what are you teaching and why are you teaching this? But the answer was the same. Well, Swaminiji asked me, and I can't say no, just like you are all here for come forward. I can't say no. And so the battle is between the logic and the love because the logic is tied with ego. And ego says, no, I don't want to. I'm tired. I don't have anything to offer. I'm going to be jet lagged. It's going to be horrendous. I'm going to be hallucinating. I'm going to make everybody sign a contract and says that you're not going to hold me personally responsible for anything that comes out of my mouth or personally responsible for anything that I don't do. And so it's not blind ignorance. Arjuna just doesn't say, okay, Krishna has told me, go fight this battle. It's going to be tough, but Krishna's got my back. I'm just going to go do it. There's, there's this discussion between them. And Krishna catches Arjuna hedging, like, are you sure you want me to do this? this the, I only have, like, so many arrows in my quiver, and they're all these enemies. Are you sure? Like, killing is bad. Are you sure? All of these logical inferences that make total sense. But in the end, Krishna says, you know, I'm, I'm the dispeller of the darkness. I'm, I'm all of these things. I'm the critters that you don't like. I'm the critters that you do like. Uh, who was there for Yin and saw me chasing a piece of fluff across <laughs> the floor? And the fluff went with the wind, and I went with the wind. That was Krishna. That was divine play. And I tried not to bump into some of you, and I succeeded mostly. That's Krishna. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Dayananda. It's very entertaining watching you chase the <laughs> <laughs> um, So, uh, for people unfamiliar uh, with the Gita, the context is that they're about to fight this big battle, and Arjuna is despondent because on the opposite side, of the war of the battle are people he knows and people he loves, um, as well as some not the best people, but um, he's despondent because he doesn't want to fight this battle. And before they actually ever got to this point, uh, he had a choice to make, or did uh, the cousin make the choice first? I think the cousin stood on the bed. Well, yeah, for Krishna, or, or the uh, uh, Arjuna got to make the choice first. Arjuna got to make because the choice. Krishna saw him first. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so he had a choice. He could choose between Krishna's armies, or he could just have Krishna as his charioteer and his advisor. And he chose Krishna. Smart, smart decision. <laughs> smart man. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Um, little did he know at the time. And so he's despondent, and now uh, Krishna is counseling, counseling him, you know, helping relieving his suffering. And what I, I love about this chapter in particular is that he lays down, you know, throughout all of this, like, what is the cause of your suffering? The cause is that you do not see me in everything. You do not see me in every action. You do not see me in every being. And here's the solution. See me. See me everywhere. Devote everything you do to me. Right? And for us, for all of us, that is what we can do to at least start that process of alleviating the suffering. If we can release these images that we have of each other, we can finally see a person wholly and fully, and we can come into a truthful, honest, and sincere relationship with them. My wife and I were actually talking about this last night because she's pregnant right now, and so many of the conversations she has with people are like, 
just about the baby. And it's like they're not even seeing her. And I'm, I look forward to you know going home today because I had multiple people come up to me and be like, how is your wife doing? You know, they're asking, how is my wife doing? They're not asking how the baby's doing, which is okay. But it's such an important thing to see someone fully and not see their occupation, not see whatever condition they happen to be in. The condition especially, because isn't that like, you know? You see someone crying, you have a reaction. You see someone angry, you have a reaction. How can you let go of those reactions? And finding that faith, finding that moment to see all of them see the whole picture, that's, that's the cure. Yeah. Absolutely. Wonderfully said. Thank you, all three of you. In this beginning of chapter 10, Krishna unfolds, and he's been unfolding continually, and for those of you who have been following this, we've been doing each chapter each week, the unfolding of a path. And here, he gives a very practical advice. He says, every human being really wants to be happy. They want joy. They want some, some semblance of, of satisfaction. And the heart calls them to a deeper satisfaction. And there's really only one thing, no, two things, that, which are really the same, um, that are going to bring to you that level of joy that you are seeking. You make the mistake of looking out at the world and seeing it all as a hindrance. You make the mistake of looking out at the world and looking at other people and seeing them all as obstacles. If you would look out at the world with loving eyes and a devotional heart, you would understand that it's all one and that there are no hindrances to your joy, to your inner light. That anything that you experience in this life that causes you some form of pain or suffering is a temporary condition only. And you should treat it as such, recognizing that this too will pass. You will outgrow it. You will overcome it. You will incorporate it. You will allow it to evolve into something else. And if divinity is the guide that you're using, that you're holding to, that you're taking sanctuary in, then you will never sweep it under the rug and you will never wish to get rid of it. Because what you sweep under the rug or what you try to get rid of comes back in leaps and bounds. So in this unfolding of a spiritual path, Krishna tells us here, he says, he tells Arjuna, he says, joy and devotion, seeing everything as one, seeing me in all possible moments. When you're super angry and you're about to curse someone out, stop. And say, I'm going to curse Krishna out in about a moment. Mm, <laughs> that a wise idea? Maybe not. It'll change your whole perception of life and your whole approach to the way that you interact with people. <laughs> Krishna, <laughs> drive correctly. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, that's it. Exactly. You can be frustrated. It's part of your human experience. You can be angry. You can be all these things. It's part of, human, of your humanness. But remember who you're talking to. Mm -hmm. And it's not as if you're talking, as Jyoti so beautifully pointed out, it's not as if you're talking to, to you know, Krishna, who's like all the way over there or all the way over there. You're talking to the Krishna who's right here. And right here in every other being. In every other being. Arjuna says, You are Brahman supreme, the highest abode, the supreme purifier, the self-luminous, Eternal spirit, first among the gods, unborn and infinite. The great sages and seers, Narada, Asita, Devala, Vyasa, they too have acclaimed you this. Now you have declared it to me. So now, O Krishna, I believe that everything you have told me is divine truth. 
Neither gods nor demons know your real nature. Indeed, you alone know yourself, O Supreme Spirit. You are the source of being and the master of every creature, God of gods, and Lord of the universe. Tell me all your divine attributes, leaving nothing unsaid. Tell me of the glories with which you fill the cosmos. Krishna, you are a supreme master of yoga. Tell me how I should meditate to gain constant awareness of you. In what things and in what ways should I meditate upon you? O Krishna, you who stir up people's hearts, tell me in detail your attributes and your powers. I can never tire of hearing your immortal words. There's so much to these three verses. But the one thing that I think is very practical that's pointed out in here is this one line. Neither gods nor demons know your real nature. Indeed, you alone know yourself. So Arjuna is acknowledging this about Krishna's essence. But Krishna is in each and every one of us. So the only person who needs to know the truth of your nature is you. We need to stop looking for accolades and appreciation and acceptance outside of ourself. Because that's one ego talking to another. It is not Krishna being Krishna. It is not divinity being divinity. So the more that we can move away from the tendencies to go outside of ourself to look for that acceptance that we, we seek, that we long for, the more that we move within and come to understand that I'm the only one who can really understand who I am, come into that deep knowing, that sweetness. Then that also changes our relationship with others. Because now we don't look at each other uh, like, we want something. So tell me what I want to hear. Show me which way to go. Make it all okay. Convince me that I'm worth it. That comes out of the equation. And instead, we begin to see each other in the light of not what can I get from you as far as my self-worth goes, but what can I give to you? How can I serve you? I see your suffering. What can I do to support the alleviation of that suffering? I see that you're fearful. What can I do to alleviate your fear? I see that, that you're maybe currently in, in the darkness of ignorance. What can I do to not compile that, to not make it worse for you? How can I serve you? So when we take the me out of the picture, you know, when we stop looking for what we get out of the relationship, then the relationship becomes so much more rich and so much more sweet. Absolutely. Absolutely. Was there something in those three verses that you would like to comment on? Jyoti, we started with you last time, so we'll go to the other side now. Let's start with <laughs> That's a very... That's, yeah. Yeah. It's so funny. A quick story. Okay. So I had a, a, a student over in New Jersey, and she got a job. A, a, she had gotten a new job working at a, a store, and her manager was a Hindu, and she, she came to me and she said, I, I really need some guidance. And I said, okay. She said, I, I feel like my manager is just being really rude because I'm asking for guidance on how they want things done. And, and basically, you know, he just kind of shakes his head at me. And I said, the store just opened, is that right? And she went, oh, yeah, yeah, just like opened last week. And I've been there like two days already. And I said, okay. I said, what do you, what do you know about your manager? And she said, well, I know he's new too. And, um, and he's, he's figuring things out the same way that I'm figuring things out. But don't you think he should have the answers for me? Don't you think like he should, he should do something more? And I said, well, what he's telling you is that he, he actually in that moment doesn't have the answer. 
That's his way of saying, I'm not sure it could go either way. And now if you give him an opportunity, perhaps he'll go find the answer. You know, talk to him a little bit more. Use communication skills. Use your big girl words. You know? <laughs> and, um, and sure enough, she came back like two weeks later. And she said, so I took your advice and I went and spoke to him. And I, he, he wasn't sure either. And I said, yeah. I said, so see, he wasn't being rude to you. I said, we need to move past these, these tendencies to judge people. Yeah. So should we ask Shambhu? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm using my big girl words. <laughs> Shambhuji. <laughs> should we ask Jyoti, Mom? <laughs> I can curl the head bubble. <laughs> Are we good? Okay. Yeah, I was just going to talk more about the fluff. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to the fluff in a moment. The next part is perfect for that. Krishna continues. All right, Arjuna. I will tell you of my divine powers. I will mention only the most glorious, for there is no end to them. So this is important because it, it amplifies the understanding that Krishna, or whatever name it is that you have chosen to call that, is not only in the glorious stuff. It's not only when things are going smoothly, that it's in every moment, in everything, in every experience. He states, I am the true self in the heart of every being, Arjuna, and the beginning, middle, and end of their existence. Among the shining gods, I am Vishnu. Of the luminaries, I am the sun. Among the storm gods, I am Marichi. And in the night sky, I am the moon. Among scriptures, I am the Samaveda, and among the lesser gods, I am Indra. Among the senses, I am the mind, and in living beings, I am consciousness. Among the Rudras, I am Shankara. Among the spirits of the natural world, world I am Kubera, god of wealth, and Pavaka, the purifying fire. Among the mountains, I am Meru. Among the priests, I am Brihaspati, and among the military leaders, I am Skanda. Among bodies of water, I am the ocean. Among the great seers, I am Bhrigu. And among words, I am the syllable Om. I am the repetition of the holy name. And among mountains, I am the Himalayas. Among trees, I am the Ashvasta, the sacred fig. Among the Gandharvas, the heavenly musicians, I am Chitraratra. Among divine seers, I am Narada. And among sages, I am Kapila. I was born from the nectar of immortality as the primordial horse and as Indra's noble elephant. As human beings, I am the king. Among weapons, I am the thunderbolt. I am Kamadhuk, the cow that fulfills all desires. I am Kandarpa, the power of sex, and Vishuki, the king of snakes. I am Ananta, the cosmic serpent, and Varuna, the god of water. I am Aryaman, among the noble ancestors, among the forces which restrain, I am Yama, the god of death. Among animals, I am the lion. Among birds, the eagle Garuda. I am Prahlada, born among the demons, and of all that measures, I am time. Among purifying forces, I am the wind. Among warriors, I am Rama. Of water creatures, I am the crocodile, and of rivers, I am the Ganges. I am the beginning, middle, and end of creation. Of all the sciences, I am the science of self-knowledge, and I am logic in those who debate. Among letters, I am the letter A. Among grammatical compounds, I am the Dvandva. I am infinite time and the sustainer whose face is seen everywhere. I am death, which overcomes all and the source of all beings still to be born. I am the feminine qualities of fame, beauty, perfect speech, memory, intelligence, loyalty, and forgiveness. Among the hymns of the Samaveda, I am the Briha. Among poetic meters, the Gayatri. Among months, I am the Marga Shirsha, first of the year. Among the seasons, I am spring that brings forth flowers. I am the gambling of the gambler, and the radiance in all that shines. I am effort, I am victory, and I am the goodness of the virtuous. Among the Vrishnis, I am Krishna. 
Among the Pandavas, I am Arjuna. Among sages, I am Vyasa. And among poets, Ushanas. I am the scepter which meets out punishment and the art of statesmanship in those who lead. I am the silence of the unknown and the wisdom of the wise. I am the seed that can be found in every creature. For without me, nothing can exist, neither animate nor inanimate. But there is no end to my divine attributes, Arjuna. These I have mentioned are only a few. Wherever you find strength or beauty or spiritual power, you may be sure that these have sprung from a spark of my essence. But of what use is it to you to know all of this, Arjuna? Just remember that I am, and that I support the entire cosmos with only a fragment of my being. Let's just close the eyes for a moment and sit with that. I'll read the last two verses again. But there is no end to my divine attributes, Arjuna. These I have mentioned are only a few. Wherever you find strength or beauty or spiritual power, you may be sure that these have sprung from a spark of my essence. But what use is it to you to know all of this? Just remember that I am and that I support the entire cosmos with only a fragment of my being. Fluttering open the eyes if they're still closed. So to anyone who would like to reply. We're going to talk about flood. Okay, go on. To put it into context, I explained um, to the workshop participants what could appear to be obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, I'm not a neat freak. My, my home is lived in, but I'm particular about my practice spaces. And this is not something that is uh, unique to this. It's, uh, it's, it's habit, it's, it's protocol, it's ritual. It's not that space is completely unacceptable and I must make it acceptable. It's that if there's work to be done, you do the work. So if you were here early before Swaminiji got here and if you were a little bored and you were watching what I was doing instead of watching what you should have been doing, I was looking for fluff. And then I adjusted the garland on your picture. I'm preparing the space for God. But wait. Everything is Krishna. That means the fluff is Krishna. That means I'm Krishna. The space is Krishna. God is chasing God to prepare for God mm -hmm. to know God. Heavy stuff. It is. <laughs> but it's a labyrinth of great beauty, isn't it? It truly is. Because just imagine that for a moment. Imagine a difficult moment in your life where you weren't sure where to turn, what to do. If your perception in that moment regarding whatever it was that you needed or you thought you needed or you weren't sure what you needed, if your perception in that moment is that everything is God chasing God, how would that situation have changed? What would you have given yourself as support how would you have perceived your situation? What would that have done to the healing process associated with any situation? It's not saying excuse poor behavior that other people take part in. It's not saying excuse your own poor behavior. This is not spiritual bypassing. This is an acknowledgement that things are much more complicated but also much simpler than what we make them that we tend to lump things under an umbrella of, of anger. We tend to lump things under an umbrella of convenience. We tend to lump things under an umbrella 
when the reality is that the truth is in all the raindrops. And sometimes those raindrops have to meet the skin of our physical body in order for us to understand that. But if we're constantly putting up the umbrella of protection, then the Krishna in the raindrops doesn't quite get to us. But that's kind of silly, isn't it? Because it doesn't have to get to us. We just think it does. It's already us. So this, this is beautiful. You know, it's like when we, when we first came to this space, so many people said, are you crazy? <laughs> and I went, maybe. But I see it. When I first walked through this space, I saw it. I saw everything from the color on the walls to the students in the halls to hearing the chanting as if it had already happened and was still echoing in the hallways. It was, and it remains to be because it still happens, the most profound experience to see what is not visible to the naked eye and to know that, am I a little crazy? I'm not worried about it, you know? This is, this is for divinity, this is for God. This is for God. And then when I went over to Ireland, you know, you'll all be getting a little bit of a notification soon. We're opening a very small meditation space over there for, for meditation retreats. And the few people that I had been talking to along the way were like, are you crazy? And I was like, maybe. But it's for God. And so in, in, in my life, what I have found is that and it goes right back to what Krishna shared with Arjuna at the very beginning of this chapter. Every time that I take a step forward, if I see that step forward as being for divinity, for God, in service of that, then my life is a much more peaceful place. So wherever I go, I'll bring Ma with me. I'll bring Krishna, I'll bring Shiva, I'll bring Ma. They're all the same. They're all one. So I just bring them with me and, and put a little something there so that others who, who might have a moment of insight can see too and maybe have, a, have an opportunity to recognize and, and to become of service in that moment. Does that make sense? Yeah. What else would anybody like to say? I'm going to say this before I forget. That last line... That's the doozy. Repeat that last line, please. Oh, goodness. <laughs> what am I going to say, everybody? It's recorded. This is a fraction of my essence. So even, and I'm giving you all the benefit of the doubt, you've mastered the Gita. That is a fraction of Krishna's essence. We can't even comprehend the rest of Krishna some of us, some of us, some of us, some of us spend our entire life trying to understand a very tiny text in the, con in the context of Indian philosophy. And that's how many words? Mm. And that's a fraction of what Krishna does. Yeah, a tiny little fraction. Just, just, tiny, just. Mm. I support all the cosmos just a fragment of my being. I think that's the thing. But so, that's what I was going to talk about. Um, what I love about that line is that you are supported. It's all there waiting for you. And even if you don't believe or, you know, you're struggling, you're suffering, you've lost faith, it's still supporting you. He, she, they is still supporting you. And so to let go of our expectation, to let go of our desires in that moment, because you know, that's what desire is, it's, oh, I am unsatisfied in some way, shape, or form. If I get this thing, I will finally be satisfied. Which sometimes, I mean, you're really hungry. You may get an apple. Um, but usually we're 
not even thinking that what's the word consciously or in the moment is thinking about the car thinking about you know I'm in rock band thinking about getting that band together and trying to make it thinking about this or thinking about that wanting this wanting my wife to do certain things wanting myself to do certain things and I'm being like man a little too tired today but releasing those desires and understanding that in this moment that you have the support of everything you're you're free right there right then it's like Kali and the rock the beach In the Devi Mahatmya, Durga brings forth Kali to swallow the demon Raktabij, blood seed, who, whenever a drop of his blood hits the floor, 10,000 more arise in his place. So every time a desire is fulfilled or let go of, 10,000 more desires fill in their place. And so only in surrender, only in faith, right, do we allow this divinity to swallow all of those desires whole. Because right? if you try and, you know, white knuckle it, right, that's a very, like, an addict thing to do is like, I'm not gonna do that thing that I want to do because I'm addicted to it physically. Right, you fight and you fight and you fight and you ultimately lose that battle because it's not a battle you can win with your own will. It has nothing to do with will. It has to do with seeing the truth, which is that you are already taken care of. And back to, you know, the this whole battle, Krishna tells Arjuna that, you know, I am everything. I am the past, the present, and the future. The battle's already over. Everyone who's already won the battle has won it, and whoever has lost the battle has lost. They are already part of me, and they will be absorbed back into me. And there's nothing anyone can do to change about that, mm-hmm. you know. So fight, live your life according to the principles that you know. You know the principles of honor and um, sacrifice and truth and justice. That's all I got. <laughs> Swami G one time was doing a talk up in uh, New Jersey at um, a student who had graduated our, our teacher training program and opened her own studio. And so we were all up there, and there was somebody uh, who asked the question about addiction. And, and Swami G's answer, which I'm paraphrasing, was along these lines. The problem with addiction is that it is both desire and it is the cause of desire. So it's like a a very wicked cycle. So the individual becomes hyper-focused on this thing as being the answer to their problems, you know, and and it's actually also the cause of their problems, right? So, So they're completely misinterpreting their situation. And then he said... He said, now, if they would see through, through that limited view and recognize that everything everywhere is Krishna, including that drug or that alcohol or whatever their addiction is too, that too is Krishna. But Krishna is the same throughout all things. So that drug, that alcohol, that, that thing can't give them anything more or less than anything else can. They don't need it. It's not that it's bad or wrong in that kind of a divine perspective. It's just that there are healthier things that can lead to their happiness that they can choose from. The problem is that they're, they're seeing only the drug as Krishna and nothing else. 
So they're choosing that drug. Now they're not really seeing it as Krishna, but I think you get the symbology to that, right? Really powerful statement, yeah. Now what in your life changes the moment that you start seeing divinity, by whatever name you call that, everywhere, you know? What, what, what changes in your life for you? How do your relationships change? How do your troubles change? How does your confusion change? Shraddha, or sincerity, or sincere faith, is a key component to that. Because it's one thing to say, everything is one, and put it on a t-shirt, and you know, that's great. <laughs> I know. There's so many of those. <laughs> it's right. But to actually know that, to, to actually be an expression of that, to, to live that, and none of these words do it justice, what we're talking about here, because this is not something that you choose. You don't wake up this morning and go, okay, today I'm enlightened, that's it. I'm going to love everybody and see everybody as Krishna. I'm done. We're finished. <laughs> Doesn't work that way. But because our English language is so limited, we try to find the closest language possible but it still leads us down that slippery slope of I'm the one doing it, of this ego is the one doing it. But it's not. It's the grace. It's the grace that allows you to know it. Just like there have been moments in your life where you have known things, and when, when you accepted that you knew it, it brought such relief to you. This is the same knowledge of that divinity and the the ever essence of that divinity brings such relief that you don't need anything anymore you don't need the fancy car or the cocaine or the sex or the shopping sprees you don't need those things if they come to you the you know maybe not the cocaine but if the other <laughs> if the other ones come to you they're they're tools only they're tools only. So maybe you use the card to give people a ride to the doctor, you know? Maybe the service to humanity is to somehow get rid of the, you know, the, the harmful substances in a way that's safe, right? Um, maybe the shopping spree is so that you can donate all those things rather than keep them in your own house, which is getting tighter and tighter and tighter because of all of the boxes and piles. So you begin to see that whatever comes to you is a tool for you to give back, for you to get out of your own self-centered behavior and into the behavior of service. Serving Krishna, serving Krishna, serving Krishna. Durga, Kali, whatever name you choose. What would you like to say? I was going to say I have nothing to say, but then you said something that triggered my, my, my memory recently. So my husband is having, was having an existential crisis this week. And he is like, I, I call him Hanuman because he's just this walking, noodly bodily body <laughs> of devotion. And he just, his, his uh, happy place is actually taking care and serving others. So like every year for his birthday, he wants to go volunteer at the Ronald McDonald House. Um, you know, like there's so many things he just always has to do to help people. And, um, and so his like, existential crisis this week was... The wondering if he was almost being narcissistic by finding joy in helping others. And in a sense, was he only helping others because he wanted someone to see him helping others and appreciate that? And he's just like, do you think I'm just helping others just because I want someone to see me helping others so that they say something nice? <laughs> now, for as long as I've known him, he just always naturally wants to help others, right? And so I'm saying to him, like, okay, well, well think about for a moment, the, like, the human body, right? Biologically, whenever we help someone, like, dopamine's released. So we actually get this, like, positive kick in the brain, right? Um, and it makes us feel really good and warm and fuzzy inside when we help someone. And so biologically, we're actually built to help others, right? Because our body just says, oh, you did a good job. Here you go. So you want to do it again, Right? And I'm like, so biologically, you're built that way. Your personality was always, since I've known you, to always want to help. I'm like, so if you're doing something seeking, like 
a good old pat on the back. I'm like, we'll do it anyway, but just become aware that that's what you're, you know, you're hoping for. And then when you don't get it, sit with that, right? Um, I have so many notebooks with all of your classes. <laughs> I have my Psalm eating tea notebooks <laughs> over the years. And I remember someone saying to me for the longest time the same thing over and over again. And I think I was looking at it in the capacity of like fears over here, love is always here, I'll try to live here. But you explained something one day to me, um, and it was, and I remember drawing in my one notebook a line. And on one side I wrote good, and on one side I wrote bad, and in, in the middle it was just like this is the middle. And so um, I remember you talking about how we always like label things good or bad, or it's okay. And we have a tendency sometimes to think about we only want to live in the good, we only want to receive the good, we get the bad, we identify it as bad. But you said, just start to not see it. It just is, mm -hmm. right? And so when we walk in the world, we recognize that Krishna is the moon, and Krishna is the sun, and Krishna is the flowers, and Krishna is you. And Krishna is me. Um, at that point, when something happens, it just is, right? As opposed to needing to slap a label on there because it's a gift either way. Mm. That's really hard work. It's very hard work. But when we live that way or we attempt to live that way, <clears throat> what ends up happening is when we're stuck in the other mode of good and bad, we become resentful of what we label as bad. We become um, avoiding uh, we become um, concerned and, and fearful. We become easily irritated and frustrated. We become judgmental. We become so many different things. And, and then there's a part of our psychology that feels badly because we feel those things. And so now we're no longer even dealing with the situation at hand. What we're doing is reacting to our reactions, reaction, and then it just compiles itself. So when we take away, you know, to some degree, this idea that things are either good or they're bad, and we just say, this is actually life being lived. And not all of life is going to be comfortable. Not all of life is going to feel great. Not all of life is going to be sparkles and unicorns. Matter of fact, some parts of life are darn right difficult and painful and some parts of life are horrific and if i'm present to that without putting some kind of a label on it as best i can then what i can do is address that i can be present to it i can see what has to be done what needs to be done what doesn't need to be done i can be of a greater service to myself and to anybody else who is who is in need because of that situation Otherwise, we become complainers. We become professional complainers. You know, there shouldn't be war in the world today. And what's happening in the Ukraine is really just horrible. Da -da 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 and we'll go on and we'll t we'll, we will spend hours and hours and hours that we will never get back again complaining about the conditions here, there, or anywhere. But we won't lift a finger to do anything about it. So we have effectively moved ourselves away from where we are needed and we have moved into a darkness of ignorance and become lethargic as a result. Now maybe we do something, maybe we do make a donation or maybe we do send some supplies or work with a local organization, that's wonderful. Still, don't complain. Complaining will, will suck the light out of your heart. It will leave you feeling devastated. It's, it's a very deep groove that keeps getting written in a record that is hard. It takes a long time, if not lifetimes, mm -hmm. to change. So the important thing to remember is that joy comes from within. The light comes from within. But the light is also everywhere else, and so is the joy. And joy doesn't mean happy, happy. Doesn't mean, yay, everything's satisfactory and smooth and I'm good. No, as a matter of fact, joy is the simple, energetic vitality and radiance that happens when you're present purely. 
when you're present purely. Because all distraction leads to guilt and sadness and a sense of losing out on something. Does that make sense? Okay. Time check. Oh, where's my time check? There we go. All right, so we have just a few moments left. I'd like to go, to go down our beautiful panel here and ask for last thoughts. Whatever you want to say. It could even be Hare Krishna. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever you would want to say. Long, short, whatever. We'll start with Shambhu this time. (laughs) Matthew definitely is Hanuman. (laughs) (laughs) Think about that Shiva statue. (laughs) There's a much longer story about that. Matthew Matthew loves to help people. um, And he loves to help me mostly because I don't like to receive help but I will begrudgingly receive help from Matthew, but there's no other choice. Uh, and one was lifting a very heavy uh, Nataraj Murti from my teacher, Yogi Amit Desai, that I bought at his 90th birthday to, to fund our next initiative. And it barely fit in the trunk, and it took two full-grown human males, everything we could to get it into the trunk in the 50 feet from the parking lot to the gift shop. And I thought, there's no way I'm going to get this thing out of my trunk, I'll call Matthew. And Matthew picks it up one-handed and takes it into the basement. And I thought, well, I must have been tired or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and then I had to adjust the altar last week, and I attempted to move that thing by myself. Matthew is on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> Look at it this way, Shambhu. It's Krishna helping Krishna. There you go. Was, <laughs> Absolutely. Exactly. Absolutely. Diana. I was going to ask if anyone had questions. If you seemed oh, we were getting to that. <laughs> <laughs> nice segue, though. Yeah. How are you? And Jyoti Ma, do you have anything you would like to say before we open up for questions? No, thank you always for everything that you share with us. Um, I, I, I learn so much from you all the time, so thank you. Oh, it's my honor, but it's, it's dharma, right? We help each other, we guide each other, we teach each other. It's always both ways, always. Any, any questions or reflections? Reminding of a conversation I had earlier this week and one I had late last year, um, friend DJ had given me a copy of his Bhagavad Gita, and I had gone to Dayananda and I said, "Can I take this to the beach and read it in one day, or do I need like a a study guide?" And he had said to me, it, "It's something that you could read one verse and sit with that for a week, or sit with that for a month, or sit with that for ten years." And I've been doing that since then. Um, and then earlier this week, someone had asked me how I was doing, and I had said, I'm a little exhausted from what I'm doing all day long and fasting for Ramadan. He says, oh, are you Islamic? And I said, he had known me for a long time, but not very well. And I said, no, but I do hold space for prayer and fasting and solidarity. And um, he said, and I said, you don't know this, but my background is in anthropology and religious studies, and he's like, do you have a favorite religion? I said, yes, the one that brings peace to the practitioner. And then he had gone on to say how he would practice something else, and I said, it's just funny how in your religion, you were first convinced that you were separated, and then this is how you return back to it. And um, I just didn't reflect it. There is no separation. And so I just didn't reflect it on that. Absolutely. Very beautiful. Thank you for sharing. Take Krishna to the beach. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you can read it in a single day, yeah. but that's not the end of it. That's not the end. Yeah. Yeah. Matter of fact, in, in the in, in the two hundred YTT when we have students who have who have not been introduced to the Bhagavad Gita, um, typically what I'll say to them is read it through once like a novel. Just get accustomed to the story. There's a lot of long names in there. 
You know, there's a lot of things you're not going to be aware of or, or familiar with. So just read it through once for familiarity purposes and then go back and then read it slowly and, and meditate or concentrate on different verses. If they touch you, you know, if, you, if you're like, you can really relate to this, then, then stop there and spend some time just sitting with that. And, and then when you feel that you've journaled enough or contemplated enough, then go on and continue. Um, and in that way, you're building familiarity and, and then you're also having the opportunity for contemplation. But yeah, Krishna is already at the beach. <laughs> yeah. To, to those of you that have been to Gujarat, Gujarat is where um, Dwarka, where the battle occurs, is the peninsula. It still exists in Gujarat. Mm -hmm. And so it's sort of an inside joke because the entire state of Gujarat is one giant beach. <laughs> we were just saying this morning how Gujarat is like a world of its own. Yeah, it's an area in India where my guru was from. And um, yeah, it's a very, very special place. Any other questions or reflections? So, was, did you find today's talk useful, supportive? Yes. Yeah. I'd like to thank these beautiful beings, as always, for their presence and for sharing their wisdom and for humoring me when I said, can I put you on the spot? <laughs> I'd like to thank you for being here today, for coming out to have this conversation, and I pray it serves you well and that it, it opens the, the curtains and lets the light in a bit more every day and every moment of every day. So let's sit tall, close the eyes. Draw the hands together in front of the heart. <clears throat> and together we'll lift our voices in one om. Take a breath in. Oh. Bowing the head to the heart. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. May there be peace in all the realms, in all the hearts, in all the beings. Join the face to center. Thank you all so much for being here today. Delightful to see each and every one of you. Someone said one time, why do you make eye contact with like every student? And I said, because I want them to know they're seen. It's important. Make eye contact. No more looking at people's shoes. <laughs> Be present, because when you look in the eyes, you see Krishna. You see Krishna. You see Ma. You see, you see that divinity. If you haven't had brunch yet, enjoy. It looks really, really good. Mm -hmm. And give them some love down in the kitchen, and I'll see you all next week. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.